Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. We started talking about the gastrointestinal system in physiology. We had an introduction. We talked about the slow wave rhythms versus the spike potentials. We talked about the calcium calmodulin system. We talked about the nervous control of your GI. The nervous control, of course, includes the enteric nervous system and something to stimulate it, parasympathetic, and something to inhibit it, sympathetic. This aforementioned nervous control is not the only game in town. You also need endocrine control, GI hormones. Let's get started. Let's answer the question of the previous video. Why are you tired after a big meal? For three reasons. Number one, after you eat, you stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. And of course, when you are resting and digesting, you are um, resting, tired. Unlike the sympathetic nervous system where you are super active because you're running from a tiger. Reason number two, eating causes an alkaline tide, which we'll talk about later. Basically, your stomach is releasing acid to the inside of the stomach and base to the outside of the stomach, causing an alkaline tide in the bloodstream. Acidosis used to stimulate your chemoreceptors. However, alkalosis will do the opposite, inhibit your chemoreceptors and decrease your respiratory rate. So you feel tired. Moreover, when I decrease my respiratory rate, What's going to happen to oxygen level? It will decrease. You'll be tired. And when oxygen goes down, what's going to happen to carbon dioxide? It will go up, especially because of decreased respiratory rate. And when carbon dioxide goes up, you're also tired. Reason number three. Diaphragm goes up when you eat. Why? Because the viscera are taking more space. So the diaphragm has to go up, diminishing the thoracic dimensions so you will get tired you can also add number four when i eat the gut will take more blood from other organs so i'll feel tired control of gi motility and secretion is done by the nervous system please refer to the last video and the endocrine system this is today's video Hormones are slow because you have to wait for the gland to make them and then to secrete them into the bloodstream. Hormones in the blood will go all over the body until they find the target organ, which takes lots of time. And that's why you will never hear of hormonal stimulation for salivation, because salivation is for chewing. Many people do not take their time chewing food. So we have no time to wait for hormones. If you have to wait for hormones, it will be over. The food would have left your mouth and will be in the esophagus. That's why when it comes to salivary glands, it's only nervous. Because while chewing, the saliva has to come out fast. A matter of definition, autocrine, paracrine, endocrine. Autocrine, auto means self. When the cell secretes something to act on the same cell, this is autocrine. When the cell secretes something to act on the surrounding cells, this is paracrine. And when the cell secretes something into the blood, and the blood will take that something all over the body, this is endocrine. It has to be released into the bloodstream. That's why it takes a long time. Do you remember these layers? Yes, we do. Mucosa submucosa musculosa serosa. The myenteric plexus is here. The submucosal plexus is here. Motility versus secretions, as we have discussed before. Look, we can divide the functions of your digestive system into mechanical and chemical digestion. Mechanical means motility. Chemical means secretion. Motility is by the myenteric. Secretion is by the submucosal. Myenteric is in the musculosa. Submucosal is in the submucosa. Here is the anatomy of the GI tract. This is easy peasy. Please pause and review. Glands can be divided into endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine do not have duct. These glands will secrete their secretions into the bloodstream, which will take it to distant target organs all over the body. Exocrine glands, however, do have ducts which will secrete their secretions into nearby structures. The former is the story of GI hormone, 
the latter is the story of GI enzymes. Today, we're just talking about hormones. These GI hormones will affect GI functions, i.e. motility and secretion, to cause digestion and absorption. Where do these GI hormones come from? Most of them come from the upper part of small intestine. But gastrin is special, because gastrin comes from the upper part of small intestine and from the stomach as well. All of the GI hormones can be collectively called enterogastrone. Your pancreas is a very interesting organ. It has exocrine and endocrine in the same organ. Exocrine, because it has ducts, it will secrete its secretion to nearby structures, i.e. the duodenum. Example are the pancreatic enzymes. Also, the pancreas is an endocrine. Some of it is ductless. Directly release my secretions into the bloodstream. These secretions are hormones. Here is the exocrine pancreas. Here is the endocrine pancreas. It has many cells. Today, we'll focus on the delta cells, which secrete the doofus somatostatin. Somatostatin comes from the delta cells. Why is it a doofus? Because it's a universal inhibitor. It inhibits everything. It even inhibits its own secretion. Quick review from head to toe. In the mouth, mechanical and chemical. Mechanical digestion, mastication. Chemical digestion, salivation. The most important salivary enzyme is the salivary amylase, also known as tealin. How many salivary glands do you have? The answer is gazillion. How many major salivary glands you have? Three pairs, parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. So you only have six major salivary glands, but you have tons of minor ones. Where are the minor ones? They are buried in the tongue, in your lips, in the mucosal membrane of the mouth, etc. After the food leaves my mouth, by swallowing or deglutition, it's going to end up in the esophagus. Where the upper third of the esophagus, skeletal muscles, which means voluntary, middle third, mix, lower third is smooth muscles, involuntary. Next, the stomach, mechanical and chemical. Mechanical is motility, chemical is secretion. Secretion of what? Many things, especially the acid, hydrochloric acid, HCl, from the parietal cells, the enzyme, pepsinogen, from the chief cells, and the GI hormone, gastrin, from the G cells. If you're getting started, you have to memorize these three. The first is an acid, the second is an enzyme, the third is a hormone. Eventually, you'll need to memorize six secretions from the stomach. Parietal cells, also known as auxentic cells, secrete the acid and the intrinsic factor to absorb vitamin B12. Next, the chief cells, also known as peptic cells, secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is not active. It causes generation of pepsin, which is active. How can we transform pepsinogen, which is not active, into pepsin? To convert this, you will need the acid from the parietal cell. Next, G cells secrete gastrin. Gastrin is pro-gastric. It is pro-stomach. It boosts motility and secretions of the stomach. This is the only hormone that loves the stomach. All of the other GI hormones hate the stomach. The stomach has tons of mucosal glands with goblet cells. They secrete mucus. Mucus is very important. It's protective and it's alkaline, which protects your own stomach cells from excessive acidity. Moreover, you have some delta cells in the stomach for the doofus somatostatin, which inhibits everything. You also have enterochromaffin-like cells that secrete histamine, which activates the parietal cells so that they may secrete more acid. Parietal cells secrete acid and the intrinsic factor so that you can absorb vitamin B12 at the terminal ileum. If you want to learn more about vitamin B12, I have a special video just about B12. And you shall find it in my biochemistry playlist. Some people have a disease known as pernicious anemia. They have antibodies that destroy the parietal cells. When you lose the parietal cells, you lose intrinsic factor. When you lose intrinsic factor, you lose the ability to absorb vitamin B12. So you develop vitamin B12 deficiency, which causes macrocytic anemia and neurological symptoms. Now to the GI hormones. 
Some general rules, all of them can be collectively known as enterogastrone. All of them are peptides or peptide derivatives. Most of them are secreted by the upper part of the small intestine, except gastrin, which is secreted from the gastric, the stomach, and the upper part of small intestine. All of them hate the stomach, i.e. decrease gastric motility and secretion, except gastrin. Gastrin is the only one that loves the stomach. It boosts gastric motility and secretions. All of them come from upper part of small intestine. Which cells? Specialized cells known as APUD cells, which stand for amine precursor uptake and decarboxylation. These are the GI hormones that we'll talk about today. Gastrin, secretin, cholecystokinin, pancreasimin, or CCK, VIP, GIP, motilin, and the dufus somatostatin. First, gastrin. Who made you? G cells. Where do I find them? The stomach and upper part of small intestine. I'm the only one that is pro-stomach. I boost stomach motility, I boost stomach secretion, I grow the stomach mucosa, sometimes I increase insulin release after you eat. Because you need insulin in the feeding state and you need glucagon in the fasting state. What are the factors that boost gastrin release? The presence of food in the stomach. Well, no kidding, because gastrin's job is to help digestion. What kind of food? Well, protein, because the function of the stomach is to digest protein. That's why some cuisines will serve you soup before your main entree. Why? Because soup is an appetizer. It boosts gastrin. There is nothing like grandma's soup made with pure love. It also boosts gastrin. Next, when there is food in the stomach, what's going to happen to the pH? Well, the stomach is getting diluted thanks to all the food that you're eating. Anytime pH goes up, gastrin will go up to secrete the acid to decrease the pH. And of course, since the parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest, vagus stimulation, especially with the GRP release, will boost gastrin. What is GRP? Gastrin releasing peptide. This reminds me of the hypothalamus stimulating the pituitary. We had gonadotropin releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone, etc. Next, secretin, secreted by the S cell in the upper part of small intestine. It goes to the pancreas, endocrine or exocrine, exocrine, as in our cells or duct cells, duct cells, as well as the bile system. To do what? To boost secretion. Of what? Well, let me tell you. Secretin cares about one thing, the pH of the intestine. Once your food leaves the stomach, which is acidic, and gets dumped on the duodenum, the pH of the duodenum will drop, which stimulates secretin release. Secretin releases tons of water and bicarb from the duct cell of the pancreas. This bicarb will help neutralize the acidity in the duodenum so that your duodenum becomes alkaline because the enzymes of your duodenum just like the enzymes anywhere in the body except the stomach need an alkaline medium in order to function next cholecystokinin pancreasimin two names very important why do you call it cholecystokinin because i am peptide or protein i n that cause kinetic movement, I move, the cholecyst, the cyst that has the bile, i.e. I move and contract your gallbladder. Oh, move my contract and gallbladder to do what? To push the bile out into the duodenum, because the bile is important for emulsification, which helps absorption of fat. Now you understand why we call it cholecystokinin. Next, why do we call it pancreasimin? because I boost enzyme secretions from the pancreas. Enzyme, so endocrine or exocrine? Well, enzyme has to be exocrine. Duct or acinous acinar cells. And these acinar cells will secrete digestive enzymes from the pancreas, such as terpsinogen, for example. These enzymes will go to the duodenum to help with digestion. And of course, it goes without saying that all of these GI hormones, except gastrin, 
hate your stomach. They decrease gastric motility and secretions. It also decreases gastric emptying, giving time for the duodenum to digest. What are the factors that boost CCK release? The answer is the presence of food in the duodenum. So let's review. Secretin is secreted by the S cell, acts on the duct cells in the pancreas. CCK, released by the I cells, cholecystokinin, acts on the acinar cells of the pancreas. Next, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Vasoactive, it's active on vessels. I like to call it vasopassive because it relaxes and dilates vessels. It also relaxes smooth muscles in your gut, because these also have smooth muscles. In other words, VIP is a relaxer of smooth muscles, causing vasodilation of vessels and relaxation of the gut wall. And it goes without saying that it hates your stomach. Next, GIP. It has two names. Glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, abbreviated GIP, or gastric inhibitory peptide, also abbreviated GIP, secreted by the K cells. Guess the location, upper part of small intestine. Why do we call it glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide? Because when you eat sugar, it will help you release insulin from the endocrine pancreas. Why do you call it gastric inhibitory peptide? Because it inhibits your stomach. Oh, no kidding. All of the GI hormones hate your stomach, except gastrin. And of course, it will get stimulated when you eat, because the feeding state calls for insulin. Conversely, the fasting state calls for glucagon. Next, motilin. Of course, it is pro-motility. GI motility, including gastric motility, intestinal motility, all kinds of motility, even the migratory motor complexes, those strong purging movements that happen when you're not eating. To clean your gut from everything that did not go through in the first time. Motilin is released by the M cells. Guess the location. Upper part of small intestine. The dufus somatostatin released by the delta cell. It inhibits everything. It inhibits secretion of everything. It inhibits motility of everything. Somatostatin is such a dork that it even inhibits its own secretion. There is a drug that mimics somatostatin. It's known as octreotide. We can use this octreotide anytime you have abundance of anything. If you have excess of esophageal dilation in vessels, we give you octreotide. If you have a tumor secreting too much gastrin, give you octreotide because it will inhibit everything, including gastrin. If you have a tumor secreting too much insulin, take octreotide. A tumor releasing too much glucagon, octreotide. A tumor releasing too much somatostatin, octreotide. A cool mnemonic thanks to Ellie from New York. First, you need to iron your clothes, then you fold them, then put them in the closet. So, iron is the first one to be absorbed. It's in the duodenum. Then you fold them. Folate is next, absorbed in the jejunum. Then you put them in the closet. Cobalamin is last, in the terminal ileum. Thank you so much to the intrinsic factor from the parietal cells of the stomach. Let's make it clinical. Five minutes ago, I told you about pernicious anemia and lack of intrinsic factor. Here is another clinical tip. Imagine that you have two persons receiving glucose. The first one is receiving glucose orally. The second person is receiving the same dose, but intravenously. The question is, which person will have a higher blood insulin level and why? Pause and think about it. If you are a pharmacology aficionado, you will say, you know what? IV drugs have a very high bioavailability, so I'm gonna go with B. That's a doofus. The fallacy that you committed is ignoring physiology, ignoring GIP, i.e. the glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, which is released by your gut by the upper part of small intestine. Therefore, when you take the glucose orally, it reaches the upper part of small intestine, releasing GIB, which boosts 
insulin release. This lovely GIP will not be stimulated if you take glucose intravenously. So the answer is A will have a higher insulin level. Why? Because of GIP. Next, if I have biliary colic, colic is a type of abdominal pain because of a problem in the biliary system. Let's say I have cholecystitis, which is a stone stuck here at the cystic duct. Every time my gallbladder will contract, oh, it hurts. Why? Because I'm contracting against an obstruction. Whenever a hollow viscous contracts against an obstruction, it gives you a colic. In your bile, it's called biliary colic. In your kidney, it's called renal colic. The former is caused by a gallstone. The latter is caused by a kidney stone. Why does biliary colic hurt? Because you have a hollow viscous contracting against an obstruction. Thanks to cholecystokinin, who's contracting the gallbladder. So yes, cholecystokinin, you are cool most of the time. But love can hurt. Another clinical tip. There is a tumor called vipoma. It's a tumor, usually in the pancreas, releasing too much VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide. What happens when you dilate and relax blood vessels and relax glands? They will release more. Because remember I told you before, if this is a secretory cell, it needs a blood vessel to get the raw materials from. If I dilate this blood vessel, thank you VIP, I will get more flow and more raw material to my secretory cell, secreting more. That's why you end up with watery diarrhea. Too much watery secretion. And because you have diarrhea, your stool is moving too quickly and you did not have enough time to reabsorb and reclaim your potassium. All of the potassium is ending up in the stool. You get hypokalemia. VIP, just like any other GI hormone, hates the stomach. It decreases gastric motility and secretions. When you decrease the secretion of HCL from the stomach, you get achlorhydria. No, hydrochloric acid. More tips. Nitric oxide causes relaxation. If you want the mechanism, check out my video titled Calcium Calmodulin System. So you can argue that nitric oxide and VIP are friends because they are relaxers. Next, your stomach releases something called ghrelin. Ghrelin increases your appetite so much because ghrelin wants you to become a fat gargoyle ghrelin gargoyle. The opposite of ghrelin is leptin. Leptin wants you to become thin. The way I remember it is that I remember leptin tea bags. The tea bag is hanged by a thread, a very thin thread. If you want to know how do we manage peptic ulcer diseases, you can download my Utacoids pharmacology course. I also have a renal physiology course on my website medicosisperfectionatus.com. I have a surgery course, antibiotics course, emergency medicine course. We got all kinds of courses. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus where medicine makes perfect sense.